Mars! Woo! We did it! We landed! Well, we didn't, but the Perseverance rover successfully landed on Mars just now. It was amazing to watch live as it happened. And we don't have a lot of images yet that are from the rover as of the recording of this video. But what I want to do in this short little video is to let you know that I'm going to be covering Mars in great detail. I'm doing a series that's going to be coming out in the next several months where I cover every single planet in the solar system, and there's a lot of them, and Mars is one of those planets. So what I want to know from you is what is interesting to you about the planet Mars? What do you want to know? I have my favorite subjects about Mars. I've been studying Mars for years and years and years. I named a whole YouTube channel after Mars. But what do you want to know about? I want to make sure I answer your questions when I make that video. I'm also going to talk in more detail soon about the Perseverance rover itself. Let's talk about this thing real quick because it is just an amazing piece of engineering. Now, uh, superficially and on the whole, this is really similar to the Curiosity rover, which landed about 10 years ago on Mars and has been doing incredible scientific research. But what's different with uh, this spacecraft, with this rover, is not uh, just uh, some of its instrumentation, which is much more advanced over the past decade, as you can imagine, even though it's about the same size and though it's a little bit heavier. While previous Mars rover missions were focused especially on the establishment on the finding of past and current liquid water, should it exist, this mission is definitely an astrobiology mission. Now, no life forms have ever been discovered outside of the planet Earth that are actually of some kind of extraterrestrial origin. But it's entirely possible that this wonderful rover, this incredible Perseverance spacecraft and explorer, will be one of the first to do it. And that would be really incredible if it does. It does have some really cool and exciting instrumentation on it, which is capable of that. One of the ways it's going to do it is to actually drop samples that it's going to be collecting in a cache or a cachet. And then a future mission is going to recover those samples and, uh, and send them back. And uh, just a little impression I had of this, which I think is... Um, it is just how I see it is uh, I am definitely go with the amazing Robert Zubrin who thinks that if you want a sample return mission, you should design a sample return mission and not combine a lot of things into one big expensive package. One uh, reason is that if you have one mission that's meant to do several things, and this mission is supposed to do like three or four really big important things, then if there is a failure, that can be, you know, that can be really terrible. So for example, uh, this mission is supposed to do several things. Not only is it supposed to collect samples for a sample return mission, it is also supposed to do a lot of actual in situ scientific analysis. It's also going to be testing a human oxygen generation system. Um, human oxygen generation isn't really part of the mission of doing the scientific exploration, which is what this is supposed to be uh, doing. And it's also going to be testing a little uh, drone that's going to be flying on Mars, which is super cool. And as a pilot, I love the idea of something actually flying, doing powered aerodynamic controlled flight on Mars is super interesting and cool. But at the same time, just as from my little understanding of how engineering and uh, is supposed to go, is that this isn't the best you know, way to... Uh, to do all of this all at once if you have the opportunity of splitting something like this up into dedicated missions. Now, with budget constraints and also the limitation of getting to Mars every two years, I see why they were able to rather effectively combine these things together. I'd rather a sample return mission just go collect samples, send them back on the same rocket so you can actually get the samples back within a couple years instead of six or seven years later, which we might get. Assuming that mission works, because then you're dependent on multiple systems and so forth and multiple agencies. In this case, it looks like an ESA rover, which is really cool, will be uh, cooperating with NASA to return the samples that Perseverance collects. But that means we'll be waiting that long, um, and humans are going to be arriving on Mars, hopefully thanks to SpaceX, in around the same time frame. It seems a little slow to me. And uh, at the same time, if this is a scientific instrument that could do a lot of that uh, research on Mars, a lot of that discovery, I kind of think, oh, it'd be really nice for this machine to be able to concentrate just on the uh, actual analysis and not have to worry about dropping samples in a place where another rover, maybe a less capable rover, will be able to even pick them up. So uh, that's the kind of thing that's, uh, that I think about with all of this. So these are just my you know first impressions, having seen uh, the launch and having been aware of the Mars 2020 rover called Perseverance for years and years and years. I'm so glad they actually got it out the door in time in 2020 so it would land on time today in February of 2021. So super exciting. Again, please let me know what do you want to know about Mars? What in detail do you want to know about this mission? What do you 
hope that this mission will discover. Uh, I'm going to tell you all about it once we get some good pictures back from the Perseverance rover from the Martian surface, hopefully in the next few days. Thanks so much. I'm Luke. This is Polymathy. Thank you.